it's got to be a no ball. Yeah, way outside the return crease. The back foot there was uh, not just touching it, it was way out. This is getting a bit farcical. Curtly, Ambrose had once said, I let the ball do all the talking. Well, on that day, the ball must have had a lot to say. A whole bunch of misgiving, selectance, bitterness and anger, the sheer weight of history crushing down on one person, which ultimately caused one of the greatest baller in cricket's history to ball a 15 balls over. Today, we tell the story of that over, the worst over ever balled. Now I'll start by saying that I know, theoretically, this isn't the worst over ever. On paper, it has to be Mohammad Sami's 17 ball over in 2004. But whereas that was a low stakes encounter against a newly emerging Bangladesh, this, this was a matter of cricket's crown, the pride of champions. And so we begin our story with the Frank Worrell Trophy. Now started all the way back in 1960 between Australia and West Indies, it was supposed to be just another bilateral cup like Ashes to be played every two years on alternate venues. But then everything changed when West Indies won the first World Cup. Now at the time, Australia was hands down the best team in the world and losing to West Indies in the finals was seen as an affront to their pride. So in the Frank Worrell Trophy that was held just months after the World Cup, Australia would go on to destroy, and I literally mean destroy, that West Indian team, which then caused them to create that legendary pace squatted and return the favour four years later. So basically, this trophy in time came to be known as the stage on which the throne of cricket would be bartered, the platform for the two best teams in the world to battle their hearts out. And starting from 1988, the sole purveyor of this crown, the hand that would tip the scale, it was to be of Curtly Ambrose. First deployed against Australia in the 1989 version, he would rip through their entire batting lineup, becoming the highest wicket taker and the player of the series. But it would be the cup after that that would turn him into a legend playing in Australia, trailing 1-0 with two matches left. West Indies would win the first one by just one run, while the second, what would be later described as one of Test Cricket's most devastating spell, Ambrose taking seven wickets in just 38 balls, pulling Australia down from 85 for 2 to a loss by an inning. This loss would be such a shock that the Australian captain Alan Border would be fired and then on would call Perth, the venue of that mind-boggling spell, a home ground in Australia for West Indies. But as legendary as that victory was, it couldn't hide a simple fact. Whereas before, they would have just walked all over Australia. Now it was taking legendary efforts to eke out a victory. And this would be the perfect foreshadowing of what was to come in the next cup when for the first time, their greatest weapon failed. Riding on the backs of an exuberant Stewart and a rampaging Magrath, Australia would go to West Indies and defeat them. Not just once, but twice. West Indies would try hook and nail to claw back the lead, but it would all be to no avail. For the first time in 15 years, West Indies would lose a series, bringing an end to an historic record. And then, as if to rub salt on their wounds, they would once again lose to them, this time in a World Cup semi-final, where West Indies would go from 43 required and 52 balls and 8 wickets in hand to getting all out, with 5 runs still left on the board. And the blame for all this repeated humiliations would fall squarely on the shoulders of Curtly Ambrose. In spite of recovering from a shoulder injury and in spite of being their most economical ballers, he had failed to take wickets. And that was used to turn him into a scapegoat. His failure being used by the media as a symbol of the fall of the West Indian star. Everybody finding consensus of this being the end of the West Indian era. Everybody except the players themselves. Ambrose went on to write in his autobiography, Yes, we were falling behind the Australians, but still felt we had a good enough team to go and beat them on their home soil. And that had become the goal of this West Indian team, to avenge their defeat in their homes by defeating the victors in theirs. And given the rumours that Ambrose and Walsh were seriously considering retirement, this might as well be the last chance that they would get. So the West Indians were hungry and it could be clearly seen. As in the first test of the 1996 Frank Worrell Trophy, they would pounce on the Australians with a vengeance, quickly reducing them to just 196 for 5. But what was to become a pattern in this tour? Everything the ballers did would be quickly negated by the batsmen, who then quickly collapsed like a pack of cards. 
handing Australia the victory. The second test would actually feel like a copy paste as they again reduce Australia to just 131 for 5. But then, just as the match seemed to be in their grasp, the West Indies would lose 7 wickets in a single session on the last day, giving Australia another victory. So, in spite of the ballers not lacking any motivations, the West Indies found themselves down to zero right at the start of the series, in danger now of being completely whitewashed. Thankfully though, there was to be some respite. This tour was to be a mixture of a test series on one side along with a trilateral ODI tournament on the other. And the next few weeks were to have those ODIs instead of tests. This would be a golden opportunity to this West Indian team to acclimatise themselves to this Australian pitches. And along with the batsman, the one desperately trying to make use of this chance would be Kirtley Ambrose. He would write in his autobiography, I was well aware of my lack of rhythm. In the first two games, I was not quite at my best. So prior to the third test in Melbourne, I put in some extra work in the nets. The net session was my gym, my workout. I was never afraid to spend hours and hours in the nets and those hours would slowly show their effects, as by the time the fourth ODI would roll around, Ambrose would ball a near-perfect line, conceding just 16 runs in 10 overs. Such was his confidence, his drive by this point, that in a team meeting right before the third test, he would declare, Gentlemen, don't worry, I am taking 10 wickets in this match. And the result? In Ambrose's words, I was disappointed. Because I did not live up to my word, I fell short by one. Yes, despite suffering from a hamstring strain, Ambrose would go on to take 9 wickets in the third test, simply overwhelming the Australians into submission. The West Indians now actually had a chance to grab onto the revenge. And with two tests still left to go, the effect that this victory had on this team was plain to see. Whereas before, they had lost all their ODIs against Australia. After this test, they would go on an undefeated run in the ODIs, knocking Australia out of the contention even for the finals. And Kirtley Ambrose. He had become a one man wrecking crew, simply pulling his opponents into a victory. After a long time, he was looking like the Grim Reaper of old. And hence, what happened next was nothing short of a tragedy. Ambrose, batting in the Tri Series final, would get hit on his thigh. The ball would hit him so hard that it would nearly leave an indentation on his leg. And by the next morning, he couldn't walk. The next few days would be spent in trying to do everything possible to heal his injury. Ambrose at one point even saying that even if I can amble in and ball, I have to play this game. If we could somehow just draw this test, then the final test would be at Perth, their home ground, his home ground. But it was not to be. Ambrose would not be cleared to play the fourth test. And the Australians would quickly pounce on this opportunity, sending the entire West Indian team back to the pavilion within three hours of the start of the test. So freed was the West Indian morale by this point that they would somehow miss six catches and a stumping and have two wickets invalidated by a no ball, ultimately leading to the second worst defeat ever at Australia's hands. And as his team was being humiliated by their rivals, all Ambrose could do was sit and watch. For him, this was nothing short of sheer torture. Brought up with the old West Indian mindset of winning at all cost, this collapse was the stuff of his wildest nightmares. So, as his leg healed up in the run-up to the last test, he would be consumed by just one thought to win. If not for the glory, then let it be for the pride. We need to win at all costs. I need to win at all costs. And this desperation would spread through his team like wildfire, making an already contentious series into an all-out war. On a day where the temperatures would touch an inhuman 43 degrees centigrade, it would still fall short of the tempers on the pitch. Every ball balled would be followed by a glare. Every ball defended an insult. And the hottest among them would be reducing Australia to 49 for 4 in the first 18 overs bold. And though Mark Walk and Bevan would provide some resistance, Ambrose would not be denied, taking 5 of the 7 top order batsmen as his prey, getting Australia all out for just 243. And finally, West Indian batting would rise up to the challenge. Lara doing with the bat what Ambrose had done with the ball. Australia, for the first time in this series, would be pushed to the very brink, causing them to lash back in anger. 
and when the west indians responding in kind the back and forth would run throughout the match finally coming to an head when brian lara would come out as a runner for the captain courtney walsh walsh was suffering from a heat stroke and just couldn't run anymore but such was the argument that ensued due to the runner that the umpire after having to intervene for the upteenth time would dress down both the captains right there on the field and watching all of this from the other end would be curtly ambrose who had been used for target practice by the australian bowlers throughout his stay at the crease and now seemed to be out for blood opening the third inning with the scalps of blevet and taylor but that is when he would feel it while being used as a punching bag in the last inning a few balls had hit his leg nearly on the same spot that had been injured before it had been playing slightly ever since but knowing full well that his partner in crime walsh just couldn't ball anymore he would try to soldier on deteriorating his leg in the process and now he just couldn't take it anymore finally informing the captain who would promptly send him back to the pavilion now himself having to start bowling meaning a heat stroke ridden sick hobbling captain who had been reduced to a medium pacer under the crippling sun who seemed to be even struggling to stand up properly but then who somehow with his team pushed into a corner would go on a 20 over long five wicket haul spell reducing australia to 133 for eight nearly single handedly finishing the match with a superhuman effort the only thing left now was to clean up the tail and with walsh simply not being able to carry on anymore amrose would once again decide to take the field he had spent the last few overs watching his brother ball his heart out practically killing himself for a chance at a win and now the big man had a fire burning in his heart he would end this match he would end this match right here right now so that his friend wouldn't have to pull more weight his mind was made up he would ball no matter the cost but when his mind was ready his body was a completely different story for a bowler at ambrose's level they are like precise machinery trained through years and years of practice their run up their actions being drilled into their body but what happens then when you throw a grain of sand in the clockwork What happens when a small niggle in the leg subconsciously changes the run up minutely minute to the point that it is not even noticeable but then what happens when you suddenly have to start bowling that to with the pressure of the world on your shoulders well what happens is the very first over that Ambrose bowled after returning the longest over of Curtly Ambrose's life where starting from his second ball his leg would cross the line for a no ball Now even though he could have written it off as a one off mistake Ambrose would quickly adjust trying to go over the wicket for the next but after bowling one legal ball the next would be once again a no ball so would be the next and the next I kept overstepping the line Ambrose would say later I even tried to use my experience to put it right like coming up with a shorter run up going around the wicket but nothing worked I even slowed down my approach at one point but I still went over the line and by this point the entire stadium had erupted in laughter sarcastically cheering him along as he tried to ball one legal ball and though the next two would find his leg on the target it would be quickly followed up by another two no balls Walsh would come and talk to Ambrose by this point Ambrose actually asking him Kadi man what do I do next should I ball some off spin now with Walsh replying na big fella that's not going to look good So Ambrose, now assuaged by his captain belief in him, would run in to get it right this time. But once again, now say it with me, following it up with two no balls, and finally, finally, as he would ball the last ball, ball number fifteen, in an over that had lasted for twelve minutes, he would be met by a standing ovation by the crowd. And all the serious man could do in response was take his cap off and acknowledge the cheering crowd. So here's the thing, though, this torture. Could not end here. This was Ambrose, Curtly Ambrose. How could he take this defeat lying down? So, as the next over would end, on would he rush to Walsh, demanding to ball another over. If for nothing, then just to prove to himself that there was nothing wrong with him. And so started another round of torture. This time, going for a total of six no balls in an over. Ambrose would later go on to say, "It hadn't happened before, and it didn't happen since. To this day, I'm still trying to figure out what went wrong." and even after nearly 20 years after that incident i have not yet come up with an answer
Well, for many years, the answer was simple. He should have kept balling. The more he balled, the more his body would fall back to his natural rhythm. And as the no balls decreased from the first row to the second, they would soon disappear. But thankfully, or regretfully, in the match, he would not have to do that. Ian Bishop would clean out the tail, followed by the West Indian openers, making a short work of the required 57 runs. West Indies would win the match. But it wouldn't change the fact that the series had been lost. They would win their pride, no doubt. But the throne would still be lost. That would be the last time that M. Rose would play on Australian soil. And though nowadays people remember that dead rubber test, for the gaffle in the end, with M. Rose's name fondly included in the list of worst overs ever, but there, hidden right behind that humour, is the sheer force of will through which an ageing, hurting superstar had given his all. And that is how I choose to remember this match. Not as something that would lower his image, but a moment, a single moment, where for once, we could see the man behind the monster. A man who balled despite his injuries. A man that just had a bad day.